Yes, good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first trip, but it's been so impressive today that I think I might well come back, depending on how you receive me. So, <laughs> I have to give you the customary health warning. Um, this is an article on me in the magazine called Science, and uh, I was a little bit put out the fact there wasn't a question mark after the, the dangerous professor, but... Uh, Maybe they were right. Maybe I am. Maybe I will change your mind, and uh, maybe that'll make things different uh, in the future. Let's hope so. Uh, some of you may remember this image of me. Um, this is me being sacked. This is a caricature of me being sacked from my position as the government's chief advisor on drugs in 2009. Uh, it's a brilliant caricature. You know, makes me look young and attractive. Um, <laughs> there's a book of cannabis falling from my hand. And the, the key element in it is, uh, are the scales of justice at the bottom left-hand corner, where you see the, on the left side, beer and fags, and on the right-hand side, uh, little plastic bags with strange green chemicals. And you can see the caricature has just summed it up. You know, the beer and fags are more of a problem, uh, currently anyway, in the United Kingdom, than whatever <laughs> is in those, uh, those, green, uh, those green powders in those bags there. But also look to the top left-hand side, an amazing coincidence, the very same week that I get sacked, <laughs> Andre Agassi confesses to taking crystal meth. And that, and that was how he sold his book. The strap line for selling his biography was that I took crystal meth and I lied about it. When he was Wimbledon champion, he tested positive for methamphetamine, which is crystal meth. And the lawn tennis rules then and now say a minimum two-year ban for testing positive for a Class A drug. Could be a lifetime ban. And that presented the tennis authorities with an enormous problem. Do you ban your number one player in the world just because they took a recreational drug once? And they really didn't know what to do. So they did what I thought was a very English thing. They decided to ask him to tell the truth. Andre, did you actually take crystal meth? He said, of course not. Your test must be rubbish, like your tennis players. And, uh, and he said, oh, good. I'll go away and never pee into a bottle again. And uh, <laughs> he never did, and he never tested positive again anyway. And, uh, but that, then, eventually, when he's falling on harder times and he wants to tell his life story, he, he decides to come clean. And I don't know whether he came clean because the burden of guilt sat on his shoulders for 15 years, or his publisher said, well, there's two million more copies are going to be sold if you tell him about your drugs. Uh, I suspect the latter. Um, but what it sums up is this amazing ambivalence in hypocrisy around drugs. So you can have your career ruined if you test positive for a drug, but if you're important enough, you'll get away with it. Because he's not the only sportsman who's broken the law about drugs. I mean, Lance Armstrong did it for seven years. And, and as long as he was winning, no one was going to do anything about it. But if you're important enough, you can get away with taking drugs. But if you're not then you're going to get punished and your whole career could be ruined for doing something which probably wouldn't do any harm to you and certainly, in his case, wasn't going to improve his tennis. <laughs> so the reason I got sacked, w w summed up in these headlines, uh, we had done a, a, a quite a sophisticated analysis of the harms of different drugs and it, it became clear from those analyses that some drugs, like drink, were more dangerous than other drugs, like ecstasy. And there's some images from the newspapers which uh, reported this, uh, this analysis, which I'll share with you in a minute. And, uh, and that created hysteria amongst the government who decided I had to go because telling the truth about drugs was not something they expected from their chief scientific advisor. <laughs> I still struggle with that concept. But <laughs> and I just want to share with you what the government chief scientist said at the time. So he said... He backed me, and he, he said that, in fact, Professor Nutt was right, and alcohol and cigarettes are more harmful than cannabis. He said, of course he's right, and uh, maybe, he, it, maybe my position wouldn't, would have been more tenable if he was around, because actually that, that weekend he was in Kazakhstan, and apparently telephones don't work in Kazakhstan, <laughs> even if you're a government chief scientific advisor. So, so and I didn't have any allies in government, and between the Home Secretary and the Prime Minister, they managed to get rid of me. However, he's right, I'm right, and I know we're right, because Obama now says we're right. So 
It is now a fact. It is now a fact that cannabis is less harmful than alcohol. And, and, and this, this is an extraordinarily important statement from Obama. Because as some of you will know, two American states have legalized cannabis. And that has blown a hole, not only through the U.S. Uh, drug policy, but also through the U.N. drug policy, because the U.N. drug policy was what the U.S. told it to do. And n the fact now that uh, the U.S. federal government can't control its own states means that it has no autonomy or authority over other countries. So this is, gonna, this is truly one of the most remarkable changes in terms of international policy developments in our lifetime. And at last, we now can have a proper debate about the appropriate uh, uh, legal approaches to drugs, free from the, this overwhelming and oppressive influence that America has had on it on the topic for the last 60 years. So I, I'm a scientist, uh, and I need to address this question. What is a drug? And who should say what a drug is? This is my definition of what a drug is. Something a politician once used but now regrets. <laughs> because, of course, this is how the debate in the United Kingdom is constructed. It's about what politicians want to think about drugs. And here are a couple of quotes. Jackie Smith, the Home Secretary, with whom I locked horns over the uh, comparison of uh, horse riding in ecstasy, when she was made Home Secretary, they asked her the question, did you take drugs? And, of course, the sensible response to that is, yes, but I only drink half a bottle of Chardonnay a night. <laughs> but instead of saying that, she said, oh, well, I smoked cannabis uh, as an undergraduate, but I didn't enjoy it. Now, I want to... In England and Wales, I mean, maybe it's different on the island here, but, but not liking a drug is not a defence in court. <laughs> And you, I really wish I'd, she'd tell me why she smoked. I think it was at that time, that was what you had to do to get into the Labour Party in Oxford. But I don't know. <laughs> David Cameron, our current uh, Prime Minister, said, I did things when young that w I shouldn't have. We all did. And that's called the Eton We. <laughs> and um, it's otherwise known as the Tory front bench. <laughs> and the great thing about David and his friends from Eton, they're conservatives. And they're very conservative in the drugs they took. And they only took drugs beginning with the letter C. <laughs> I rather like Boris's approach. He's another old Etonian. And his view is to make a joke about it. It's an outrageous. <laughs> and we suspect he still does, by the way. <laughs> and, of course, here is this wonderful quote from... The past leader of the free world, George W. I wouldn't answer the marijuana question. You know why? Because I don't want some little kid doing what I tried. So <laughs> there's a lot to be said for stupidity, isn't there? <laughs> so that's, that's a bit of humor. This is very serious. And this is sadly the most important slide of the night. So the drinks industry want you to say no to drugs, that way you'll have more time to drink. And this concept that alcohol is not a drug has been uh, promoted by the drinks industry to such a level of sophistication that the majority of people think alcohol is actually either a foodstuff, and in some cases they think actually it's some form of health aid. But in fact, of course it's a drug. However, when you go to the public and you say to them, as we did for the BBC Horizon program a couple of years ago. Is alcohol a drug? People in the, the general public will say to you, well, of course not. And you say, well, but yeah, but it must be a drug because you drink it to change the way you feel. And you might drink too much and get unsteady and, and fall over. And, and you might have a hangover the next day. It, surely it's a drug. And they look at you as if you're a bit simple and they say, if it was a drug, it would be illegal. <laughs> and in a way, they're right. But... Uh, the problem with that kind of definition of a drug is it becomes self-serving. And alcohol is clearly a, uh, a powerful drug, which is, of course, one of the most popular drugs in, in the world. And I guess the majority of you use it. So in true scientific terms, a drug is a chemical which, when taken, produces physiological changes in the body. And in the context of 
what we're discussing today, it's changes in the brain, which are usually pleasurable, but of course may be harmful. And the drug laws and, the, uh, and all the uh, attempts we have to try to regulate drug use is around that balance between uh, pleasure and harm. And the damaging effects of drugs uh, <coughs> come in many forms, but of course the most extreme is death. And these are two individuals who died from taking drugs. Now the one on the right is that's an old photo of a girl called Leah Betts. How many of you have seen that photo? Yeah, most of you, even though it was 20 years ago. And she died on her, just after her 18th birthday. On her, the day of her 18th birthday, she took, we think, about two ecstasy tablets, about 80 milligrams of ecstasy, the same dose as we used in a Channel 4 program last year, uh, which wouldn't normally kill anyone. Um, but she was under the mistaken belief that if she felt unwell on ecstasy, she was dehydrated. So that, that might be true if you're dancing all night, but in fact she was just preparing her parents' house for her 18th birthday party, and she started to drink water, and she drank seven litres of water, and she died of water poisoning. The guy on the left, Gavin Britton, is one of the many students who die each year of alcohol poisoning. He was a, uh, in the Exeter University golf team. He played a golf match with another university. And then they went, he went to the bar like many men, and increasingly women in sports teams do now, and engaged in a drinking game. He lost the first round, so the forfeit was to drink more. So he drank more, and he lost the second round, and the forfeit was to drink more. And by the time he lost the third round, he was dead. The people that sold Leah Betts or ecstasy tablets, the guy who got six months in prison, the friends of Gavin and his golf team who poisoned him by forcing him to drink when he was clearly intoxicated, didn't get any punishment, but uh, hopefully they don't do it anymore. But the main message of this is not that drugs kill you. The main message is that no one has ever heard of Gavin Britton. But most of you have heard of Leah Betts. Why would that be? And of course, the reason is that the drinks industry put that image over the media, over billboards throughout the United Kingdom because they were terrified at the time that young people would switch to using <coughs> ecstasy rather than drink alcohol. And there's been an in, that, a process of of trying to obscure the harms of alcohol and magnify the harms of other drugs perpetuated by the drinks industry since that time. And it's been so powerful that almost none of you know of anyone who's actually died of alcohol poisoning. In fact, the, the people who have died of alcohol poisoning, you think, have died of other drugs, like Amy Winehouse. Now, most of us, when Amy died, we assumed she died of taking drugs. In fact, she died of alcohol poisoning uh, at least that's what happened. We knew that when the coroner reported it. But that the reports of her, the reason for her death, were very much less uh, obvious than the fact that she'd originally died. And this is a very, a very sad case, not be simply because we lost a great talent, but we lost a woman who was an alcoholic, who was recovered. She met the criterion of our UK government's opinion about alcohol addiction, which is it's six weeks of being dry and you're recovered. And like many addicts in recovery, she had lost tolerance to the drug she was addicted to. And when she resumed drinking, she a level of alcohol which would not normally have killed her, 450 milligrams per cent, did kill her. So she's a victim in a sense of her own success. She was dry for long enough to become vulnerable and she died on relapse. And there's almost no research being done anywhere in the world to help people like her, who are clean and dry, stay abstinent. And this is common. Three young people a week in the United Kingdom die simply of alcohol poisoning. And about another ten die of driving their cars into the trees or into other people. If we look at deaths from drugs, we see it's an extremely skewed profile. Tobacco kills about 80,000 people a year, although they tend to be middle-aged and elderly people. Alcohol kills about 8,500, and the age range of deaths goes from 15 to, to 80. <coughs> Opiates, magnified on the right-hand side, kill about 1,200 a year. Paracetamol, about 200. Cocaine, about 180. Um, Fetamine's about 50. And cannabis, ecstasy, methadone, virtually no one. And one of the reasons I continually battled my government 
about drug policy was that I could see that the media and the government's fascination with drugs like cannabis and ecstasy was either a confusion, but more likely a deliberate ploy to avoid focusing attention on the real killers. It, there was a, it, there's a pretext that you're doing something about cannabis and ecstasy, but even though there's not a problem, and that justifies doing nothing or obscures the fact you're doing nothing about drugs like tobacco and alcohol. And for comparison, I thought you might like to see these data. So if we want to compare other preventable deaths, we see in the United Kingdom melanoma is now killing over 2,000 a year, road traffic accidents 2,500, suicide about 6,000, and AIDS about 400. Now, over the 10 years I worked for the government, I, one of my main goals was to try to develop objective, transparent, reproducible ways of assessing the harms of drugs. And over the, a period, we developed the most sophisticated <coughs> metrics for measuring drug harms uh, using this 16-point scale. These are the 16 ways in which drugs can harm you. Nine of them relate to the way harm, drugs can harm the user. They can kill you. They can make you ill. Uh, they can make you lose your job, your tangibles, relationships, etc. And seven are harms to other people, ranging from injury, driving your car into someone when you're drunk, to environmental damage, deforestation of the, uh, of the Amazon as people grow more coca leaves, etc. And having done that, we then took 20 drugs and worked through all the relative score of these 20 drugs on those 16 harms, massive task, and then we waited for each individual harm. And having done that, uh, that took several uh, days of work, we came up with this graph, which is quite well known now. And this graph looks at the ranking of these 20 different drugs in terms of overall harm. So the total size of the bar is the harm of the drug to UK society. The, blue, the size of the blue bar is the size of the harm to the user. And the size of the red bar is the size of the harm to society. And to my surprise, I have to say, <coughs> alcohol came out on top. And when we look at why alcohol is the most harmful drug, it's because this huge red bar. And that is because alcohol has such a pervasive impact on society. And I'm going to go through that shortly. You see tobacco is down there at about fifth or sixth because it's also widely used, cannabis rather lower. And again, the drugs that governments like to get hysterical about, like mushrooms and ecstasy, hardly uh, cause any social harm at all. What was worrying about that analysis was that there is actually no relationship between the harms of these drugs and their position in either the United Kingdom or the, the Manx Drugs Act or the United Nations Conventions. Zero correlation. And that means that the drug laws are not based on evidence, they're based on something else. And therefore, they're likely to be ineffective and they're certainly unjust. I just want to take you through why alcohol is the most harmful drug. This is perhaps a statistic you're not all familiar with, but you should be, particularly those of you under 55 and who are male, because the most likely reason for you dying before you're 55 is alcohol. Alcohol is the commonest reason for male deaths in the United Kingdom under the age of 50. That in itself is justification for doing something about it. These data show why men are dying. They're dying in part because of alcohol-related liver disease. Now, this is a remarkable graph because this graph looks at standardized death rates. The likelihood of any of you dying from a disorder of the circulatory system, ischemic heart disease, brain disease, cancer, respiratory disease, etc., over the last 40 years. They're all standardized to 1970. And what you see is all the colors except the red line go down. <coughs> Some of them go down to a third of what they were in 1970. And that is because we as a population are healthier and medicine's better. That's what you'd expect as medicine and science progresses. 
However, liver disease, liver deaths have gone up five times when heart disease deaths have gone down three times. 80% of that rise in liver deaths is due to alcohol. 20% is due to viral hepatitis. So this is a tidal wave of liver deaths. In, liver deaths will exceed heart disease deaths in men under the age of 60 by the end of this decade. And it's an unpleasant and expensive way to die. We know it. We've seen it happen. We've monitored it on a year-by-year -year basis since 1970, and we have done nothing about it. In fact, all the British government has recently done has decided to stop collecting the data because it's actually too unpleasant. It is truly outrageous that that has been allowed to happen. Why has it happened? It's happened because in the United Kingdom, I imagine it's the same here, young people have started drinking, most initiate alcohol consumption between about the ages of 12 and 14, and by the time they reach the 15, half of all 15-year-olds are drunk at least once a month. And that's true in 2011, the latest data, where we see 54% of girls and 50% of boys are intoxicated once a month. Exactly the same as in 1995, when it was slightly in favour of the boys being drunk. So we have known that young people are drinking dangerously for 20 years, and we've done absolutely nothing about it. In fact, if, any, if anything, we've allowed it, uh, made it easier for them to access it. So that's one reason why alcohol is the most harmful drug. It's a drug you can get when you're young, and you, once you're young, once you're on it, you continue to use it. Another reason relates to brain damage. Now, we're continually seeing things in the newspaper. Some of you may have seen something last week. Cannabis causes brain damage, a study of, I think, 20 American students. It didn't cause brain damage. It actually just produced a slightly different shape of certain subparts of the brain. We have known for 200 years that alcohol does cause brain damage. It's about the only drug you can say in a reliable fashion does cause brain damage. These are brain images from four of my patients and four controls at match for age and gender. And what you see with the bottom images is that there's lots of shrinkage of the brain. These images, there's two in the middle, they've got more damage from alcohol than the average patient with Alzheimer's disease. In fact, it turns out that alcohol is now one of the major contributing factors to dementia. So these people have damaged their brain from alcohol in an irreversible way. Unquestionably, alcohol damages the brain. It also damages society. We have had a number of talented politicians. George Brown, comp competitor for Harold Wilson. More recently, Charles Kennedy, the leader of the Liberal Dems. Careers terminated by their drinking. And the most remarkable one of all was few years ago when the, the whole of the Polish government was wiped out in a plane crash when the pilot said we can't land it's too foggy and the head of the Air Force who was drunk on the plane said no you will land uh, the pilot was right but they're all dead so alcohol in terms of affecting judgment has very profound deleterious effects and it affects politicians here, here we have a very interesting politician a man who was a soldier he lived in the real world before he became a politician, but drank excessively, got into a fight in the Commons, one of the Commons bars, nutted a Conservative MP, and is now no longer in Parliament. So alcohol makes people do silly things. And it's a massive, massive cause of violence. And I show you this image, just to, it doesn't matter what you wear, alcohol will still make you violent. And there's one thing you really should note there is that this... One of the dangers of getting drunk at Ascot is the fact that a, a champagne bottle is more dangerous as a weapon even than a wine bottle. So just be aware of that. And it's even more dangerous if you've been hit by a broken leg of a table. But the relationship between alcohol and violence is, is very intimate. And alcohol produces a whole range of damage to families and friends. Most spousal abuse is alcohol-related. A lot of child sexual abuse is alcohol-related. There's vast numbers of uh, uh, harm to society through accidents, etc., etc. I don't want to go on in all of it. But I also want to point out that there are environmental insults from alcohol. Before the Gulf oil spill, the largest man-made environmental disaster was the Exxon Valdez, that ship, which drove into the coast of Alaska because the captain was drunk and wiped out a few thousand miles of 
of flora and fauna. So alcohol has a pervasive effect across the whole range of the different ways in which drugs cause harm. And in fact, you might say, well, you know, this, is, this is amazing. Why don't we do anything about it? Well, I'm going to tell you why we don't do anything about it. And I'm going to use this slide to illustrate that. So this slide looks at 15 ways in which alcohol kills you. Different kinds of cancer, cirrhosis here, they're color-coded for men or women or both together. You see the curves are always upwards. Some are very steep, some are less steep. However, you'll see at the top right-hand corner, ischemic heart disease, uh, the orange bar is for men. And you'll see for low levels of alcohol consumption, the graph goes down a little before it starts to go up. That's not true for women, but it is true for men. That's called the J-shaped curve. That is the supposed health benefits of alcohol. Now, when the Blair government had a cabinet office review, which I was part of, reviewing the harms of alcohol, they looked at that and they said, ah, but look, there's a benefit, and there are a lot of harms. But because there's a benefit, we cannot adjudicate. Well, of course, they didn't say that. The drinks industry told them to say that. And they decided to do nothing about alcohol on the grounds that there might be a health benefit. That's the health benefit. These are all the disbenefits. And that was a, a, a complete abdication of political leadership to say that that was sufficient justification for not doing anything about alcohol. It's a trivial effect. And what's worse, and this is a very important health message for you, if you really believe that you're going to get a health benefit from alcohol, the optimal consumption of alcohol to get that health benefit is half a unit a day. Now, you cannot buy half a unit in a bar. So what I suggest you do is after this, you go out and you buy one pint of beer and three straws, and that way you'll get the health benefits and you'll meet some people as well. <laughs> so governments have turned a blind eye to alcohol, but they have been absolutely fascinated by the oppo political opportunities offered by cannabis. So this is Alan Johnson, the man that sacks me. There's me in the spliff with my moustache. And uh, the only thing that's wrong with that, it wasn't a Class A row, it was a Class C row. But anyway, because at that time, cannabis was a Class C drug. Now, cannabis has proved to be a very useful political football because a lot of people use it. And what we've seen in my lifetime is a, a massive change in cannabis use. 20-fold increase in the number of people using cannabis since 1970. And you might imagine, therefore, if cannabis was harmful, that would turn out, or that, would, that, that, that increase in use would be manifest in some harms. Well, I showed you there are no deaths, or virtually no deaths. And that presented governments with a challenge uh, uh, because they wanted to justify making cannabis class B rather than class C for political purposes. And they scratched around to find some other uh, so pr presumed harm of <coughs> cannabis. And they came up with the idea that it might cause schizophrenia. Now, that's an interesting concept. It's not implausible, but it's a testable hypothesis. And we tested it. We said, look, let's go to the MRC database, which is uh, a massive database run through general practices in the United Kingdom, and let's look at whether this 20-fold increase in the use of cannabis has led to any change in schizophrenia. Well, if you look at the incidence rates, the yellow or the prevalence rates of schizophrenia, at the bottom, the blue, there's no change. Or if you look at psychosis, there's no change. In fact, if anything, they're going down. And this is true in no Western country where there's, there's been this 20-fold increase in use. Has, there ever, has any of them shown any increase in the rates of schizophrenia? It doesn't cause schizophrenia. In fact, if you are generous to the evidence that it might then you can come up with this calculation. You've got to stop 5,000 young men from ever smoking cannabis, 7,000 women, to stop one case of schizophrenia. Now, that is not a public health target, and it's certainly not a target that could ever be achieved by criminalizing users of cannabis. But, nevertheless, the government of Gordon Brown did a deal with the Daily Mail that if they reclassified cannabis... The Daily Mail would support the Labour Party in the last election. Well, the Labour Party kept their side of the bargain. They reclassified it to B, but the Daily Mail didn't, surprisingly. <laughs> so
So what we now have, because of a policy of criminalising people for their own good to stop them using cannabis, we have a million young people in Britain with criminal records for cannabis possession. We've created an underclass because they can't get jobs in government or the civil service or teaching or medicine. And in fact, what do they do? Well, they just deal drugs and, uh, and, uh, and other cr commit other crime. And that's one of the major factors in why we had the riots in London. So we've actually built a rod for our own back simply because it was politically expedient to target uh, people using cannabis. So that's one reason why we've got to get the laws right, because it produces injustice. But another, another point, and this is something I want to spend a bit of time on now, is the way in which the drug laws massively impede research and treatment innovation. And this is something I wasn't so aware of when I was working for the government, and I've got interested in it since I've started to try to understand the therapeutic utility of many drugs which are banned, and also work with them. And I've discovered it is extremely hard to do this kind of work. And if you want to read about this, those of you who are interested in the scientific side, this is a paper I wrote last year. And it puts out the case for uh, the therapeutic utility of many drugs, you know, cannabis, psychedelics, MDMA, ketamine, and how the drug laws have made that research virtually impossible. And I would argue that, that the drug laws are the worst case of research, research censorship ever in terms of medicine. I can think of one other worse example of censorship of research, but you've got to go back to 1616 for that, and that was when the Catholic Church banned the telescope because it was telling the truth about the position of Earth in the heavens. But the banning of drugs for research, I think, is... It's been going on now for over 50 years, and it's been extremely destructive. And it's so destructive that people don't know why it's there, why the, why the bans are there. People don't even know there's therapeutic utility for these drugs. So how do we get to that situation? Well, we got to that situation through a mixture of politicians seeing drugs as an easy target, and also the media, who have a peculiar... Uh, clearly biased and sensationalist attitude to some drugs. This is a wonderful piece of research. This is a PhD done by Alistair Forsyth. He worked in the MRC <coughs> Health Unit in Glasgow, and he went through every coroner's case in Scotland in the 1990s. Uh, and they do it rather better than in England and Wales, so these are good data. And he looked to see what proportion of those <coughs> cases where a drug other than alcohol was present at death, got reported in the newspapers. Okay, he found 2,255 deaths, and of which 546 got reported in the newspapers. About one in four coroner's reports where are drugs present got reported. And then he said, well, is there any bias in terms of which drugs get reported? Well, interestingly, only one of the 265 paracetamol deaths got reported, even though they would all have died of paracetamol. One in 72 of the morphine deaths. A rare death, like amphetamines, one in three got reported. Cocaine, one in eight. Methadone, one in 16. Heroin, one in five. But the drug that always got reported was ecstasy. So the reason people think ecstasy is very dangerous is because that's all they read about in the newspapers. And that bias has had a profound effect on the population, readers, and also on politicians. And that was then in the 1990s. This is what we had a few years ago. This is Mephedrone, MCAT, Meow Meow. And this is one of the most remarkable phone calls of my life. Uh, I was in Barcelona. I was about to give a lecture. I got rung up by CNN. And I'd done an interview with them on, on MCAT a couple of days before. And they said, where's Scunthorpe? <laughs> I wasn't sure if it translated over here. But <laughs> and um, I said, why do you want to go to Scunthorpe? And they said, because the Humberside police have called an international press conference to tell the world about two deaths from Methadrome. <laughs> I said, it's impossible. You know, we, about 450,000 Israeli kids have been using it for two years, and none have died. It's inconceivable there are two methadrone deaths in Scunthorpe in one night. 
But if you want to go there up the M1, five hours turn right. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if they made it, but if they had made it, they'd have heard of this, they'd have heard this man's dad weeping. Has he urged youngsters to avoid the drug? I don't want him to be labelled a druggie because he wasn't. He was just on a night out with friends, enjoying himself, a normal, caring, hard-working lad. And every word in that sentence in red is true, except for one. He was a druggie. He was an alcohol druggie. He'd been out on a Sunday night in about six bars, and he was so drunk, as was his mate, that they wandered off and they took something which turned out to be methadone, not methadrone, uh, and they died, as most of the methadrone deaths were actually methadone deaths. Um, but the point about this is that the police had no evidence whatsoever that they'd taken methadrone, but you weren't going to get CNN to Scunthorpe saying someone died of methadone, were you? And this attempt to generate interest in places by exaggerating the risks of drugs is very prevalent. And it permeates all the thinking in the establishment about drugs. So this is what Gordon Brown said about methadrone. We're determined to act to prevent this evil hurting the young people of our country. And this is exactly what the same words as Edward Henry used in 1916 about cocaine. We're going to stop this evil. And I think that is an insult. It's an insult to the, our intelligence, because we all know that drugs don't have motivation or valence. Drugs don't choose to be good or bad. Drugs are inanimate objects. But to use terminology like that, rather than confronting the reality, is just sloppy, simplistic, scaremongering. And, and it, it betrays, the, the, it underpins, it, it emphasizes the fact that people do not want to be rational about drugs. They want to just say it's a, they're bad things, even though methadrone had a remarkable <laughs> sort of set of interesting benefits. And the most remarkable one of all is the fact that when methadrone hit the market, people switched from cocaine and people stopped dying of cocaine. There was also massive reduction in the number of people drummed out of the army for testing positive cocaine. There was an import duty of 600,000 a year, and that's all we think going to change as a result of making it illegal. Let me just show you the cocaine death. So these are the latest data on, on deaths. The, uh, the lilac is cocaine deaths, and then the blue are amphetamine deaths. And you know, I, for the 10 years up to 2009, my committee was trying to stop people dying of cocaine. We completely failed. Year on year, a rising number of cocaine deaths. As soon as the free market brings in a safer alternative, methadrone, cocaine deaths fall. They've fallen to, to half of what they were before. This is a massive saving of lives. So methadrone saved way more lives than it killed because it's a safer drug. Juiced amphetamine deaths as well. And this is the principle we use using methadone or buprenorphine, subutex, to treat heroin. We give people safer drugs. Methadrone is clearly safer than cocaine. If the government had achieved that goal of reducing deaths, we'd all be celebrating. I'd have a knighthood, as it was I got sacked. <laughs> and then that raises the interesting question. Are there other drugs that might also have benefits that we have lost because we banned them? In fact, when you look at most of the drugs that you know about which are illegal, they have therapeutic potential. You know about cannabis for spasticity and pain. You probably don't know about it, the fact that there's a lot of evidence that extracts of cannabis are useful for cancer. But many of these studies have actually been hidden by particularly the US government because they're just desperate that there should be no benefits from cannabis. Ecstasy, as you, those of you who saw the Channel 4 program saw that we were using it to try to understand its utility in trauma therapy. Psilocybin, magic mushrooms for depression. OCD and cluster headaches, LSD for terminal illness and addiction. And methadrone was being developed as a treatment for addiction. In fact, it worked because it stopped cocaine deaths. But because it's illegal, it won't be used. And I want to just briefly talk about the use of LSD in the treatment of alcoholism. The founder of Alcoholics Anonymous overcame his alcoholism by taking LSD. LSD was available in the 1960s, and there were six studies using LSD to treat alcoholism. 
And here you see a, a, a modern meta-analysis of the LSD data that the effect size, the, the value of LSD as a treatment, is great as anything we have currently. But it's been denied people for 50 years <coughs> because, well, why has it been denied for 50 years? It's not harmful. The scales that we show show it's not harmful at all. But it's been banned for political reasons. LSD was banned simply because young Americans did not, would rather take LSD than fight in the Vietnam War. And the American establishment, particularly the CIA and the DEA, were worried that America would cease to uh, behave in the way it had up to that point and would become a different kind of place. They'd, people would tune in, turn on, tune in and drop out, as Timothy Leary said. And they didn't want that. So how did they get rid of LSD? Well, they created scare stories. They created scare stories like the Scunthorpe police did. These scare stories are even worse than The Sun. The Sun, some of you remember the famous Sun headline, Mephedrone made me tear off my scrotum. <laughs> so we wrote to The Sun and said, this is a really important side effect. We need, we need to have this case report, please. And they said, oh, uh, well, well, that's what someone told us, <laughs> which means we made it up. And this is what they made up for LSD. And these are just truly ridiculous stories. Girl, but girl gives birth to a frog. This lady is being raped by an ape. He doesn't look very disconcerted by it. <laughs> this, was the, this was how the media colluded with the authorities to justify getting LSD banned. And one of the things I think we have to do is be much more objective because the therapeutic potential of these drugs could be being denied to, to millions of people who would benefit in an attempt, and, and often it's a failed attempt, to stop young people using them. So I want to finish by asking this question, because I think this is a fundamental question. How harmful should a drug be to be banned? What are the right comparisons? <coughs> well, here are four very dangerous things. One of them you know very well, you know, you know the, 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 the motorcyclist. And even having a helmet doesn't stop you from dying if you're going at more than about 70 miles an hour. But all these individuals are doing things which are potentially dangerous. But now if you're on that boat, you really don't want him coming through the deck at you, do you? <laughs> if we cared about, if harm was what we really cared about, then we'd stop dangerous pursuits. A hundred people a year die in the Alps climbing. This guy was the, our youngest ever um, man to climb Everest. He died uh, climbing in the Alps in 2009. But what's fascinating, when these people die, we hold them up as examples of people who have achieved something and are trying to do something at the extreme. But when people die of taking drugs, we see them as despicable human beings who had no right to use drugs. But these are, you know, a death is a death. There is, there is no more virtue, I would say, in dying climbing a mountain because you enjoy it than dying driving a motorbike because you enjoy it, or dying taking a drug because you enjoy it. Since you have a, a Viking tradition here, I thought I would t tell you what not to do when you're next celebrating your thing, world. You know, if you're going to jump off a mountain free, free jumping like that, well, the, the helmets are no good, but the kilts might float you down a bit. Of <laughs> and then, of course, there's peanuts. So when I... When I um, was arguing with the government, new scientists came up with this very interesting comparison that more people die of peanut allergy than die of ecstasy. So if something's less harmful than peanuts, should it be legal? Actually, why are peanuts legal? They kill so many people. <laughs> and then there's sun tanning. And I showed you the data on melanomas earlier on. Sun tanning is a fascinating behavior because the reason people like to be sun tanned is not just fashion. It's because the effect of ultraviolet light through the body releases the same chemicals in your brain as ecstasy. It releases oxytocin and prolactin. So there's a, benef there's a mental benefit from sun tanning uh, in addition just to the color change. But there's a risk. And now we have 2,000 deaths a year from melanoma. A lot of that is induced through sunbeds. We regulate that. We try to stop under 18s using sunbeds. We don't try very hard but at least we accept it. But this is an this is a, you know, example of where a, 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 sh a pleasure in young people can lead to long-term consequences. 
I've argued for a, a very long time that a society that makes money from selling alcohol through taxation has a moral obligation to allow its uh, people access to less harmful drugs. I think it's morally wrong to insist that the only intoxicant people can get is one as dangerous as alcohol. If you compare alcohol with ecstasy, ethanol with ecstasy, clearly alcohol is more toxic. And then, of course, there's a question of horse riding. And I want to just tell you the story, because people thought I was being frivolous when I compared ecstasy use with horse riding. But I'm a psychiatrist. I see people with mental problems after brain injury. And I saw a woman in her 30s fallen off a horse a few years before, smashed the front of her brain. Personality had changed, lost her job, her children, her husband, and was in a very, very difficult place because she had uh, no self-control at all. She was completely disinhibited. <coughs> I actually treated her with an illegal drug. I treated her with amphetamine, which can often help people with severe uh, attentional hyperactivity problems, which helped her a bit, but it was never going to put back the dead brain. But it got me interested in how dangerous horse riding was. And I discovered horse riding was actually much more dangerous than I had anticipated. And that was quite chilling because both my daughters were horse riding at the time. And I discovered that there's good evidence that horse riding is associated with death, neck fractures, pelvic fractures. In fact, one of the ACMD's committee was in hospital with a broken pelvis pulling off a horse at the time I wrote the article. Even Christopher Reed, Superman, died from falling off his horse. He broke his spine, never got it repaired, and died of renal failure. So I wrote this paper, my most popular paper, over 7,000 downloads. And I compared the equine addiction syndrome, equacy, with ecstasy. And it, it turned out to be a rather successful hoax, because some of my colleagues in Europe said I, it wasn't until they got to page two that they realized equacy wasn't a drug. But in fact, horse riding is a drug. Any of you who ride know that if you ride a lot, <coughs> you're addicted to it. In fact, there's a woman who writes for the Times called Melanie Reed who broke her neck and her back falling off a horse and writes vividly about the addiction she had to it and how she craves getting back on a horse. So she's now back on a horse with a frame holding her neck <coughs> stiff and her back stiff. If you look objectively at the data, you see that the harms to someone from riding horses uh, one, one serious harm per 350 episodes if you go jumping, eventing, compared with one in 10,000 episodes for ecstasy. If you're into green issues, then obviously horses are much more productive of methane than, than tablets. And as I say to the police, you know, it's much easier to police horse riding. you never smuggle a horse into a club, could you? <laughs> that created an enormous tension. The Home Secretary rang me up and berated me for making this uh, comparison. And, 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 and it was a bizarre discussion because she said, you cannot compare an illegal activity with a legal one. <laughs> and I said, well, how, how are you going to decide on what should be illegal or not? And could not get that through. And that is a, that is a major problem. Politicians are very simple people. And they like to think illegal. <laughs> OK, I'm going to finish very briefly now. I've talked a lot about the problems. There are many solutions. There are solutions on this slide here, which have all been tested in other countries and which have been shown to work. There's a lot we can do which will not destroy Western civilization as we know it, but will actually give us a more sensible, uh, a more humane, and a less harmful um, way to deal with drugs. <coughs> if you want to be a bit more radical, we could do things like they do in Holland. They have virtually no deaths from drugs in Holland <coughs> because stimulant ecstasy-type drugs can be tested. You can go and find out what you've got. If it's bad, you don't take it. And if it's not bad, then you get clear guidance on what to take and what to do if you get harmed. When I said to Jackie Smith, this is this drug, Dutch drug testing 
uh, approach has been very successful in reducing harms. Could we ask the Dutch expert over to share with us their data? She said, no. We don't want to know the truth about harm reduction. We just want to have, essentially, a political position which we can then hopefully persuade the electorates uh, will, to vote for us. We could make a safe synthetic alcohol. Modern neuroscience, modern pharmacology would allow me to create a, a substance which would give you the same pleasure of, as alcohol, <coughs> but not rot your liver or your heart or your brain, not cause addiction, and we can have an antidote, so you could then sober up and drive home safely. That is within the compass of modern neuropharmacology. Why doesn't it exist? Because no one knows whether it will be legal. And no one will invest in something when the sun could write a headline, nuts synthetic alcohol made me tear off my scrotum, and that will be a justification <laughs> for getting it banned. And that is why we have to be honest about drugs. We cannot let the media invent harms that then dictate policy. And we could do the same. We could make safe versions of drugs like MDMA. And that is happening now and in countries like New Zealand, which have a new law which allows safe psychoactive drugs to be sold. This, these drugs will be available in New Zealand. That could easily happen here. I'm going to finish with this cartoon. It may be, we may not yet have convinced politicians that a safe alcohol is the way forward, but at least I've convinced the Times cartoonists, and this is a brilliant cartoon with my alcohol and various uh, members of Parliament, such as Miller Beer, George Housing Bubble, etc. So I think maybe, well, if, you, if it's become a cartoon, maybe it'll eventually become policy. So I'm going to finish now. I'm going to mention the ISCD, Drug Science, the charity I set up to tell the truth about drugs. It's the only... Uh, source worldwide, I think, of truly independent advice about drugs and drug harms. We don't get government money, we don't get money from the people who make drugs, and we certainly don't get money from drug traffickers, but we do tell the truth about drugs. We rely on donations, so if you enjoyed what I've said, please sign up and maybe donate. And if you buy my book, you'll be able to learn a lot more than what I had time to tell you today, and all the proceeds go to the charity as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>